Okay, in this example, we're told that it rains during the construction of a building and some water is filling a pit up to some particular height, little h down here, it's half a meter. And in order to continue construction, the water must be pumped out of the pit. And so we have a hose that leads up to a pump that's located on the, um, on the rim of the pit. So the pump's up at the top. And we're given some information about the hose, that the length here is 50 meters, the diameter is 2.5 centimeters, and the surface roughness of the, the hose. And we're told that we're dealing with water, and we're given the kinematic viscosity and density. So part A of this is if we're given that the pump is at the pit's free surface, so over in this picture here, what's the maximum depth of the pit, capital H, so how deep can this pit be, in order to pump water out at a velocity of one meter per second without causing cavitation in the pipe. So remember that cavitation occurs if the pressure drops below vapor pressure. And the vapor pressure for water is pretty close to zero. So you can see it's given here, it's 2.337 kilopascals absolute. So it's, it's a very small pressure. Um, remember the atmospheric pressure is about 101 kilopascals. And then for part B, it's the same problem, except now instead of the pumping at the top, the pump is now at the bottom. And so what, um, what's the maximum depth here that we can have in order to pump water out at one meter per second? And then we're also told that really for both problems that the pump is supplied with uh, 200 watts of power to the fluid. So to analyze this, we'll apply the extent of Bernoulli equation. It's... Um, you know, it's a pipe flow style problem, so that's why I'm thinking the extended Bernoulli equation. So I'm going to apply it from a point one here to a point two right before the pump for part A. And the reason for that is because if it's going to cavitate, so, so let's just think about this for a second. It's going to be atmospheric pressure right here at one because it's open to the atmosphere. And then as the water goes through this hose, the, the pressure is going to decrease going to decrease because there's some losses in the pipe. There's, you know, as it's flowing through here, there's some viscous losses, so major losses. And we're increasing in elevation, so there's going to be a loss of pressure as a result of that as well. That's the hydrostatic pressure component. So the pressure is constantly decreasing as we go up to the pump. And so if we're going to reach uh, the vapor pressure of water anywhere, it's going to be right before the pump because that's where the pressure will be the lowest. The pump will supply an increase in pressure. That's what pumps do is they increase the pressure in the fluid. So if we went to the downstream side of the pump, it would be at a much higher pressure. So the lowest pressure really will be at point 2. So we just want to make sure we don't reach the vapor pressure at that point. So let's go ahead and apply the extended Bernoulli equation from point 1 to point 2. So let's write that down. I'm just going to put a, a few dots here. This few dots just is the same thing as what's written here. I just, I'm taking a shortcut when I write it so I don't have to write quite as much stuff. Okay, so here we have the extended Bernoulli equation. This is the total pressure at location 2. This is the total pressure at location 1. Actually, it's not total pressure. It's the total head. These are written in terms of head quantities. Everything has a dimension of length, length, length here. So total head at 1. And then this is the head loss between point 0.1 and point 0.2. And this is the shaft head added to the fluid between point 0.1 and point 0.2. So let's go ahead and evaluate what these various terms are. So P1 will be atmospheric pressure. That's the pressure right here. And we'll write that in terms of the absolute pressure. And the reason I'm going to use absolute pressure is because point 2, we want to make sure that we don't reach cavitation, the, the vapor pressure, so it doesn't cavitate. So we're going to look at it right at the limit of when that is equal to the vapor pressure. And since the vapor pressure is given in terms of absolute pressure, that's why I'm using absolute pressures here. So the vapor pressure is given as 2.337 kilopascals absolute. So if I use absolute pressure in one location, I have to make sure I use it in the other location as well. V2 will be the 1 meter per second. We're told that the flow is going through at 1 meter per second. V1 will be about equal to 0. We're assuming that this pit is a, a large surface area, so the water will be going down very slowly here, so it's nearly 0. And then Z1 
2 we'll say is equal to h. We're going to put our reference frame right here, our coordinate system, z, right at the bottom. So z2 is equal to h, and z1 is equal to little h. And little h is 0.5 meters. Capital H is what we're trying to find. Uh, let's go ahead and evaluate the shaft head term. That's this one. That, that one's pretty easy. That's actually equal to zero. Uh, we don't factor in the pump because the pump isn't located between points one and two. It's only located downstream of the pump. So it's not going to be, it's not going to factor into this, right? Because the pump's not between points one and two. It's downstream of point two. And then we have the head loss from one to two. So the head loss from one to two will be the, um, will be the uh, sum of all the loss coefficients times the velocity head where those losses occur. And in this case, we'll of course have a major loss. And that loss will occur at the same velocity as in the pipe, which is the same velocity as V2. So we'll have that one that we have to factor in. And then we would have a minor loss, perhaps, at the entrance of the pipe. I'm going to, for this example, neglect that. I'll just make a little note here. I'll neglect the minor losses. We don't have to do that, but just for this problem, I'll just make it simple and neglect it. If you wanted to factor it in, there'd be a minor loss right at the entrance here. Um, we could include that. It'll ch change the problem just a little bit. And there, maybe there's an elbow here. You know, uh, we could put something in for that. It's it's not going to change it. Most of the losses here will be due to the major loss. And of course, the major loss coefficient will be the friction factor times L over D. We're given L, we're given D. Let me just go ahead and write those down just so we have them. L, I think we were told in the problem statement was 50 meters. Let's go up here and take a look. Yeah, we're given that L is 50 meters and the diameter of the pipe is about an inch or two and a half centimeters. And then one last thing that we need to put in here is this kinetic energy correction factor at location 2. And it's pretty certain that the flow in here is going to be turbulent. So we'll say alpha 2. We're going to assume is about equal to 1, assuming turbulent flow. That's something that we'll want to double check at the end of the problem, just to verify that our assumption was a reasonable one. So in order to find... Uh, the friction factor, F here, we're going to have to use the Moody plot. And that, of course, is a function of the Reynolds number and the relative roughness. So let's calculate the Reynolds number for this flow based on the pipe diameter. That'll be V2 times the diameter of the pipe divided by the kinematic viscosity of the water. And V2 is the 1 meter per second. The diameter is the two and a half centimeters in the kinematic viscosity of water was given in the problem statement. When you plug in those numbers, this comes out to be about 25,000. So clearly that's turbulent. Uh, it's, it's well above the, the uh, critical threshold for turbulent flow. So this is a perfectly reasonable assumption. You know, it is in fact turbulent. So we have that. And then we also need to find the relative roughness in the problem statement, we're given the roughness that, that was given as, uh, where is it? Right here, 5 times 10 to the minus 5 meters. So we could plug that in for epsilon, and then, of course, the diameter, again, is still the 2.5 centimeters. So when you plug in these numbers, this comes out to be 0 0.002. So with these, we can use the Moody plot to find the friction factor. And I'll show you that in a moment, but let me just write down the number. When I use the Moody plot, I got the friction factor as being 0 0.029. So let's see if I can pull up the Moody plot for just a second, and we can look at that together. Uh, just give me a second here. There's the Moody plot. This just comes out of the formula sheet. And we said the Reynolds number was about uh, 25,000. Let me just double check. Yeah, it's 25,000. So that's right about here. So we'd follow that line upward. And then we were told the relative roughness, well, we calculated the relative to roughness as 0 0.002. So that's this line. So we'll follow that over. They intersect here. 
and then we can come across and you see that that's about 0 0.029. So that's how we use the, the Moody plot for this. Okay, let's go back to the problem. Okay, so now we have our friction factor and we can go ahead and substitute everything into this equation, everything back into the extended Bernoulli equation and solve for the height. That's the only thing that we don't know in this problem. We know everything else. And rather than bore you with all that uh, algebra, uh, let me just go ahead and work this out. Actually, before I do that, let me just do one thing. Let me calculate this major loss coefficient, the F times L over D, just to kind of show you something here. So if I plug in F times L over D, that comes out to be about 58. Now, I had said that we could reasonably neglect the minor losses, like the minor loss at the inlet. And if you look at the minor uh, table of minor loss uh, coefficients for like a reentrant jet, for example, its value is about equal to uh, one. It's of the order of one. So it's clearly much smaller than this major loss coefficient. So it's pretty reasonable to have neglected that minor loss coefficient. So anyway, if we plug in all the numbers, ultimately what we'll get is H comes out to be 7.55 meters for part A. So in order to avoid cavitation in this system here to the left, this capital H has to be about seven and a half meters at most when we have the pump on the top. So that's not that, that's not that far, right? So seven and a half meters is what roughly, uh, call it 22, 24 feet, something like that. It's not very, it's not very high. So you can't drain a pit that's, that's too deep. Now let's consider the case where the pump is down here. Okay, so in that case, we're going to, um, we're going to still use the same extended Bernoulli equation. In fact, I won't, I won't erase it. We're going to use that same extended Bernoulli equation. We're going to apply it from this point one from here. Now this time what we're going to do is we're going to apply it all the way to the point two here, which is at the very outlet of the hose. Okay. So we'll, let me, let me draw these in blue. So I don't have to erase too many things. So we're going to go all the way to point two here and the P1 will still be atmospheric, so that's no problem. Now, instead of P2 being the vapor pressure, P2, for this case, is also going to be atmospheric. Right, because for this case, we're discharging out into the atmosphere. So that is P2 is going to be atmospheric. V2 is still one meter per second, because we still are trying to pump the water at one meter per second. V1 is still about equal to zero. Z2 is still H. Z1 is still little h. Alpha 2 we'll still assume is equal to 1. It'll be a turbulent flow. It'll be, in fact, the same. The Reynolds number will be exactly the same as before because it's the same velocity V2, same diameter, which is 2.5 centimeters, same kinematic viscosity. So that'll be the same. Same with the relative roughness. We'll get the same friction factor from the Moody plot. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, let's go back to the head loss term. That's still going to look the same. It'll still look like this. So we'll still have the same head loss value. The thing that'll be different, though, is the shaft head term. Instead of being zero, the shaft head term now will include this pump because the pump is located between point one and point two. So we have to make sure we include that in. And written in terms of power, the shaft head, remember uh, from a lecture, that it will be equal to the power that goes into the fluid divided by the mass flow rate times gravity. So we'll have to evaluate that. The power then is just, uh, we're given that the power is 200 watts. So let me just make a note of that. Power is 200 watts, goes into the fluid. The mass flow rate will just be the density of the fluid times the velocity through the pump, which will be the, the mass, the, this is the mass flow rate, so it'd be rho V2 times the area, which will be just pi d squared over 4 times g. Okay, so we know the velocity at 2. This, this velocity at 2 is just the velocity in the pipe. Remember, the velocity in the pipe is the same everywhere It's because it's a constant diameter pipe. So that'll just be the 1 meter per second. And the diameter, again, we still know. So we can plug in all of the numbers, again, to solve for h. So it's, it's a, we just rearrange this equation again to solve ultimately for h. 
Again, the differences here are the P2 is atmospheric pressure because it's discharging out into atmosphere. And now we actually have the pump in between points one and two because it's now near the bottom of the pit. And when we plug the numbers in for this, what you'll get is, oops, let me try that again. When you plug in these numbers, the H comes out to be 39.0 meters. Much, much higher distance that, or higher elevation that we can pump out of. So uh, what is that? That's almost 100, and, that's on the order of 120 feet. So we can pump water from a much deeper pit when we put the pump down at the bottom. Okay, so it's advantageous when you have a, a deep pit to put the pump at the bottom. And this is why pumps are always put at the bottom of wells when you're trying to pump water out of a well for like a house out in a rural area. If the water table is pretty far below ground, you almost always put the pump at, well, you always put the pump down into the well so you can pump the water up. The reason for this is in this situation, you're pushing the water, the pump is what's pushing the water up to the surface. Because again, what the pump does is it increases the pressure across the pump. So the highest pressure is gonna be just on the downstream side of the pump. And so the pump is pushing the water up to the highest elevation and pumps are pretty powerful. They can generate very high pressure. So that's pretty easy for a pump. In the situation on the left, we're relying on atmospheric pressure to push the water, right? The pump isn't providing any kind of pushing power for the fluid at all. It's the atmospheric pressure that's pushing the water up through the system. And the lowest pressure that we're gonna get is the vapor pressure up here. So that's like a zero pressure almost. And atmospheric pressure, of course, is 101 kilopascals. That's the highest pressure we can use to push the fluid. So, so the fluid's not going to go up very far at all. This system over here is, is very similar to what you'd have in a barometer, where it's vapor pressure up at the top and atmospheric pressure down here. So anyway, if you're trying to pump fluid out of a deep pit, you almost always have to put the pump down at the bottom in order to be able to push the fluid out. Okay, we'll go ahead and end the example there.